Yes, good evening and um, a big welcome to everybody and a huge thank you, of course, to George um, for being here to talk about his long involvement in the study of uh, Lady Park Wood and the um, involvement of the arborists there, arborealists there. Um, just before I, I put George on the stage, I just want to, to give a little bit of background to him. Um, his reputation, of course, precedes him. Many people who have studied either countryside management or woodland management will at some point or another have come across the, uh, the study at Lady Park Wood. George himself first became involved in the 1970s when he was with the Nature Conservancy Council. Um, he has had a long and illustrious career. He has been a coordinator of part of the International Biology biological program, scientific officer in the Biological Records Centre. He studied virgin forests in mainland Europe, and he has held a Boulard Fellowship at Harvard University. In 1993, he became, um, he went independent and became a consultant with Forestry Commission. And then finally, he retired, but is still very, very busy writing and studying. Um, this evening we've got two wonderful books um, that he's been involved in and we're going to spend the first half of the evening looking at uh, woodland development at Lady Park and then the second half we're going to have a look at the inspiration that it's given and I'm sorry that looks back to front to most of you I suspect but um, art meets ecology. So George um, perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit about the origins of the study, and in particular, I think two two amazing characters, uh, Eustace Jones and Alan Orange. Perhaps we could start with them, and if we're lucky, we even have pictures of them. <laughs> we're lucky. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to do this. It's a, a new experience, which since I'm in my 80s now, I'm quite glad to have new experiences in life. The origins of the study, well, I think the first thing to say is that actually my main work throughout my career was as the woodland specialist or one of the woodland specialists for the Nature Conservancy and the various other things it was converted into by the government every so often. Um, and it was from that that I went to become a part-time um, consultant to the Forestry Commission. So I've knocked around a bit um, and I'm still interested. I'm, I'm quite surprised and pleased that I am, but I am. The study, um, the study didn't start with me, obviously. It started in 1944. And I'm always amazed that someone sets up a long-term study while, well, actually bombs were raining down on me. I was a small baby in London at the time, um, rushing to the air raid shelters as the V2s cut out over West London. And at the same time, Eustace Jones, we have a picture of, um, was taking his students to um, the Forest of Dean to teach them various things for their forestry course. And it was he who started this study along with many of his students. He started it in 1945 and the express intention was to study how natural woodlands develop, what happens to them. Um, he took up Lady Park Wood for very obvious, odd, odd reasons. I think, um, I mean, if anyone actually asks me why that study is done in Lady Park Wood, the answer comes down to Eustace Jones happening to like going looking for graphites in the La Wai Valley and getting to know the woods as well at the same time. So that's the origin of it. Um, Eustace Jones um, was very keen on on natural wood and he published something which is still widely quoted in 1945 about how natural woodlands work in Europe and North America. So he was the originator, a lot of other people helped and he carried this study forward for 20, 25 years. It then rather languished and um, it was only saved by the action of the Nature Conservancy officers who employed another person who was key in this um, study it was Alan Orange who as I as it was described to me actually arrived as a schoolboy or a student um, to do a summer job to basically find the transects 
measure the trees and just keep the study ticking along. What he actually did was produce some of the most high quality maps of the trees in any woodland in any study I've ever seen. And without his input, it would have languished and died at that point. So Alan Orange is a key person. And there is a third person who, of course, is my co-author on this book, Ed Mountford. Um, he came along in about um, 1990, I think it was, looking for a project as an undergraduate. And I said, well, there's some wood out here in the Y, y Valley, which needs recording. And, um, and if you fancy having a go at sort of recording the tree, that will keep it going. And you can probably make a good thesis out of that. He came and he not only did that, he stayed, he did it again and again. In fact, he carried the whole study forward to around about 2010 when his work took him elsewhere. Um, and since then, it was me emerging from retirement to keep it going. So, and I had actually done quite a lot of recording in the early 80s. So I think there are four people who's made the main contribution. Thank but you, George. An awful lot of others who contributed. That, that brings us to a really nice point because I know that you have a very short reading from the beginning of the book, which would perhaps help us yeah. to set the scene. If you, if you could turn to that, that would be wonderful. You want a reading and in the nature of the book, it's not easy to find a reading. A lot of it's very quantitative and factual. But this introduction, I think, tells you what the study is about. So here goes. Uh, the woods we see around us reflect our past and our present. Much of their fascination lies in why people created them or allowed them to survive, how they used or misused them, what they mean to people, and how the fauna and flora managed to thrive in places that were usually not designed for their well-being. But what happens when we take people out of the picture and allow woods to grow naturally? Do they take on different forms that might once have been familiar to our Mesolithic ancestors? Do trees grow, die and regenerate differently once they are freed from the molding imposed on them by generations of woodmen and foresters? Will the woods degenerate? After all, foresters have long tried to improve them. Can they recover if they've been exploited? Does the wild fauna and flora prosper or languish once the habitats generated by people are no longer there. And if, as many people have found in recent years, the human element is so interesting, do they just become tedious and boring and dull? This book is about one attempt to answer questions such as these. And then it goes on. Yeah, thank you, George. And I know that you have drawn um, over the years some very interesting um, findings and thoughts around that. And we have a very short five slides from you, which I think if you could perhaps talk to them, if Chris yeah. can start with slide one, maybe, and you can let Chris know when to move to the next, and then we'll open up to, to discussion. Discussion. Well, I was, I was asked to, as it were, describe the study and the place it, the study is taking place in. And I thought the simplest thing was to show a few uh, pictures. Um, I think there's five or six. This is the landscape, it's the Y Gorge. Um, that is a drone picture taken by a filmmaker called Cashfee Holford, and I've lifted it from her film. Um, it um, demonstrates just how rugged the territory is and just how mixed the woodland is. It's one of the very, very few places in Britain where you can see a large river flowing between ancient woodlands constituents are there. So if the next slide comes up, the wood, if you walk in there, well, if you get it in the right light at the right season, it looks like this. If you'd been there 150 or 200 years ago, it looks like that inset photograph on the bottom right. To, t to simplify, this is a wood which has had an ordinary history as a coppice with standards wood from which charcoal seems to have been the main product. But part of the wood um, was last coppiced in 1870 and hasn't really been touched ever since. And that's what happens if you leave a coppice with standards wood to grow entirely on its own without anyone doing anything for 150 years. 
and that looks fairly natural. Next slide gives you some idea of the kind of things that have happened while we've been observing. Um, we go back repeatedly and just record what's there, but one of the things which has impressed us over the years is how very much the performance of this wood is determined by events, big events. The main events have been elm disease, of course. Secondly, the drought, which has impacted on the beech and the birch particularly. And now, of course, ash disease. And I put on these two pictures of the beech just to give you some idea of what actually happened to them. In 1976, many of them were killed stone dead that year. The one on the left, which is photographed seven years after the drought, shows a tree slowly degenerating and breaking up from the top. However, there were many other beech which were not killed at all, but recovered, but were severely damaged. And those of you who were thinking of visiting Lady Parkwood might know to know that the tree on the right stands directly over the main track through the wood. And it's a place where few people will advisedly stand and discuss woodland ecology. From one side, that tree looks as if it has a full crown, it is in full, full health. From the other side, it's actually about to fall to bits. Um, and another slide shows you some of the other things which have happened. Let's see the next slide, which we saw fleetingly just now. Um, because the wood is now getting older and older and the tree is getting in poorer and poorer condition, they're falling about, gaps are being created. Here is one gap which has been created where well, the foreground bit trees came down in a high wind, but the trees in the background, believe it or not, came down in heavy snow. That's all it was, a big wet snowfall in December brought those trees down. So the next slide gives a slight taster of the kind of things we've found. And rather than spend ages reciting through this, I think it's worth just looking at the top right under constant change, where I put in the figure, which answers the question, how many of the trees that Eustace Jones first saw in 1945 at the start of the study, would he find if he went back now? And the answer is probably around about a quarter. 75% of all the trees in that wood have died since the study started. And that, this is natural mortality. It's not thinning or anything like that. And the processes which have been going on are just summarized below. We've studied the growth and how they compete against each other, which is a fairly predictable thing. But the unpredictable thing are the events and the regeneration is simply a kind of amalgam of the two, a response to the other two processes. So that is fairly unpredictable as well. Um, so if anyone asks me what's going to happen next, I literally don't know, and nobody, neither does anybody else. I think it might just be worth showing the next slide, which has got just a picture of the book, if it's still there, yes. A picture of the book cover, a large leaf lime, which um, is still standing on the slopes. And you can see there that there's a whole group of chapters which go through the performance of individual tree species in the wood. Before that, there's some general chapters about um, the wood itself and measuring, and then um, later chapters about what's happened to species and wildlife, and then some, as it were, concluding chapters, implications for long-term ecological studies, natural woodland, near to nature forestry, and rewilding. So that's the study. Um, I hope some of you have actually looked at it. It's not bedtime reading unless you're very keen to go to sleep. Okay. Thank you so much, George. I have loved it. I didn't go to sleep at all. I, I found it fascinating. Um, I know that when you were writing this, you were writing it in the shadow of Ash die back. We knew it was coming, but it hadn't come yet. I think we were hoping that um, a David Cracknell would be available this evening, would be would be in the audience. David, if you're available, perhaps you could just make yourself known. Huh. Okay, so we may have a slight technical hitch there. I don't know, George, would you like to update us? Well, yeah, the the um 
Um, purely coincidental, I'm sure, but the first time I saw any sign of ash disease in the wood was actually the week of the publication of the book. Uh, no cause and effect, I'm sure. But the very fact that I went back there in 2013 and started re-recording was kind of anticipating the arrival of ash disease. I, I wanted to be sure that we had a reasonably up-to-date record of the trees in the wood before ash disease struck. And it was by returning to the wood in 2013 and making detailed records that I started feeling that it was worth um, writing these up in some form. I thought of it simply as something you put on the internet or something of that kind. But eventually, um, the Commonwealth Agricultural Bureau um, came up with the um, willingness actually to publish it. And they did us proud actually. They, they have allowed a very large number of photographs in the publication, which means that anyone who wants to look at Lady Park Wood can actually see or read the book, but um, they, they can actually get most of what they want out of it simply by flipping through the photographs. I'm, I mean, I'm quite pleased with that, to be honest. Very few publishers would have done that. It is, it is fabulous. And if, no, if, if others haven't got through it all, I do recommend it. Um, George, I'm going to throw this open now to questions. And I have a first question just to start it off. And then I hope that everyone will feel free to, to put in their questions around the study and about perhaps around your own final sort of conclusions about whether a woodland should be left to its own devices. Mm -hmm. So the first, first question that I've had submitted was um, we're looking at Lady Park Wood after a long period of natural regeneration. And you pose a question uh, at some point about what do people want from wilderness? The recreation is something you mention, and then you mention all these, these, these dead trees and obstacles. So perhaps we could talk a little bit, or could you talk a little bit about where you see that going? The wilderness side. Mm. Your 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 talk is slightly breaking up on me. It'll be my bad broadband. Um, but um, the questions about wilderness and yes, one of the things which we can draw some conclusions from from the study is um, the advisability or other, the advisability or otherwise of rewilding. Um, Eustace Jones obviously never thought of that in setting up this project. He saw it as purely ecological. Um, but nowadays, I think one of the important lessons is to see exactly what happens if you literally rewild the wood for 150 years, what, are, what will happen? And I can show you what will happen now, because if you walk through the wood, you find yourself extremely inconvenienced because there are a lot of trees lying on the ground. Um, you also find yourself, well, essentially, you, you're, you're, you're placing yourself in danger. Um, I'm currently not allowed in that wood because it's dangerous. This is an, the Nature Reserve manager saying that um, I should keep out and also everybody else, of course. Um, and I do wonder what this implies for people who are rewilding woodlands. It's all very well now, while the woods are still in reasonably good condition. But what happens when there is a substantial event, the drought, for example, or the trees simply get old and start falling about. What will happen? Is this still going to be the kind of place people want to visit and, and recreate in? Are we going to have to change the liability arrangements under law on rewilded land? It does seem to me it poses some really serious questions about rewilding in the long term. Privately, I think that rewilding is something you can only do up to a point and that woods will have to be discreetly managed even on rewilding projects. That's really interesting. Does anyone want to come in on that point there? If so, please please either pop your name in the chat function or raise, well, there's too many of you to raise a hand. Uh, if not... Graham, uh, Graham Garrett's is... Uh, yeah. Hand up. Should we go to Graham? Uh, I see. Uh, hi everyone. Um, hello, George. Thank you for that. And um, I just wanted to come back on your point about rewilding, simply to say that it seems to me that you're referring to rewilding as land abandonment, um, which is one interpretation. But it's about um, trying to re-establish fuller 
ecological functionality and, and in an English landscape, you know, just stopping managing the land doesn't allow that to happen. You're sort of caught within that denuded ecological landscape. You know, a lot of the, um, the factors which would be taking place in a fuller, a fuller uh, ecosystem have simply been removed and, and can't express themselves. So you're looking at quite small areas subject to um, sort of um, simplified ecological processes you know, on a larger scale and in a different landscape, then rewilding might, might offer a different outcome and a different use to society. Yeah, well, I, I don't have a black and white view of rewilding at all. In fact, if anything, I'd say I adhere to a kind of slogan of wild and not wild. Um, I think it's just as important that someone living in in a London has a place which is relatively wild, not overwhelmingly controlled by people to go to and to visit and to whatever they want to do in it. Um, and that, that counts as rewilding every bit as much as this rather purist experiment out in the remote Wye Valley, which has allowed a wood to develop entirely without people having any direct influence on its progress. So, whole spectrum of rewildings and um, what I'm talking about here is one of them. Um, quite how other people view this I don't know. I mean, I mean no one's actually thought of putting wolves or bears or whatever into this wood. It'd be rather, rather exciting if it did. I mean even having wild boar in there now is livening people up no end. Um, and wolves would, um, would, would certainly hit the headlines in the, in the, the forest review in the forest of Dean. Um, so this is only a partial rewilding, really. We can't exclude the edge effects. We've only got an incomplete fauna. Um, but I, I do think that looking at how Lady Park Wood has developed, we do get, raise some questions about the long term of some of the projects which go under the banner of rewilding, especially those with woodland in them. They're going to have to be managed like anywhere else. George, you have very neatly brought us to a question from Nick Smith. I don't know, Nick, if you're available and can unmute yourself. Uh, that picks up on the point that George has just made about wild boar. Yes, um, Wendy, I'm happy to say hi to George. It's Nick Smith, a retired woodland officer from the Forestry Commission. Um, I know Lady Park Wood and the problems you have there with deer and boar. And I was asking you whether in history and time scale, you know, by excluding them from this area for a period of time, it's given you a slightly false picture and that a larger, wider experiment where you could incorporate herbivores into that scenario, whether it would give a different result about rewilding or natural regeneration. Yeah, well, as, as you and no doubt almost everybody else listening to this knows, this touches on one of the fundamental ecological points in, in looking at natural woodlands and how they function. When we faced this with Lady Park Wood, which wasn't fenced at all until 2007, we, asked, we, we, we noticed throughout that there was almost literally no regeneration once the post-war flush of recovery after the wartime fellings had worked its way through. This was a wood which was heading steadily towards being a sort of grassy slope. Um, when we got the opportunity through a European Union funded project to fence off the wood, um, we debated long and hard about whether we should take this chance. I mean, it's an expensive thing to do, but we had the money at that point and we decided we would because we wanted to see how the wood actually would regenerate if it got a chance to do so and it was getting no chance at all and secondly um, we realized that there were so many big old trees falling about in the wood that the fence was going to get flattened every so often anyway so that what we saw as, as a by putting a fence there was that we would reduced the grazing pressure on the wood, but we wouldn't reduce it to zero. We would reduce it substantially. And we rather hoped that the deer would get out because the um, several deer leaps were put round the side so that any deer that got in had the opportunity to get out, but no others would get in. I'm afraid it didn't work like that, um, but um, that was the idea. But we, 
we needed to find out just how the wood would regenerate. And this is the way we did it. In practice, what's happened is that the fence in this rather rugged terrain fails, fails quite quickly. Um, deer kept on getting in and there was always some um, deer browsing within, within the wood. Um, in the 2016, I think it was, the wild boar um, smashed through the fence, let more deer in. And the result is that there's been deer in that wood in substantial numbers ever since. Today, the fence has effectively failed. The wood is grazed flat and all the regeneration which took place from 2007 until 2017 has been completely destroyed. Absolutely. Now, I'm, I, I do agree that herbivores are part of the system, but so are wolves and other carnivores. And with the Forestry Commission unable to control the deer or unwilling to control the deer at lower levels of population or unable to control the wild boar, um, we had to do something about it. So it's an imperfect world. And we learned something by this fencing, even if it was only for a decade. Thank, Thank you so much, George, for that. Um, Nick, I hope that sort of covered the topic for you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna move, we've got a couple of questions in at the moment. I'm going to move to Mary, who's talking about the impact of um, ash dieback and what it would have been like in her wood if it had been unmanaged. And then we'll move to Martin. So I don't know, Mary, are you able to, to unmute yourself? Thank you. Hi, it, this is actually Jim. Oh, it's, it's not Mary. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's Jim and Mary. We're watching Mary. it together. We're watching it together. And we both manage our own woodland together. So it's, it's but um, we have a pause woodland in Kent and um, it was replanted after, it was clear fell during the war, replanted with poplar and conifers. We've um, had the conifers taken out, but we have uh, a massive understory of ash. And um, we first noticed ash die back in 2007 long before it was recognized as such in this country and it is now absolutely rampant there's probably only about less than five percent of the ash that have not got any signs of uh, ash dieback and um they've been gradually falling over large you know 70 80 feet tall ash falling over which we've been clearing gradually until um storm units just decimated um, the woodland with what's left of the poplar and the ash and it is um, a complete disaster area so um, I you know if you if you, le you left the woodland unmanaged as such it would just be impenetrable and it wouldn't be very nice to for any kind of activity or, or recreation well I, I can only say that I sympathize you obviously put a lot of time and effort into this place and it's now falling about Lady Park um, is not a wood. It's a wood where we try to learn how woods work. I wouldn't necessarily manage any wood as, I, as Lady Park Wood is managed. So don't see Lady Park Wood as a place which shows you how to manage something. What we have done is study, is study the ash disease in Lady Park Wood. I say we, I mean, I started a study, but it was taken on by David Cracknell, who I hoped would be with us this evening, um, working with Bangor University Forest Department. And he has um, done a very detailed analysis of how ash disease has impacted this population, which is a natural population with its natural diversity within it, not a planted source at all. And, um, and I can tell you, by 2020, um, there were something like 16% of all the ash in the canopy still had the majority of their foliage, in fact, some were unscathed. Um, the great majority were suffering and they suffered even further in 2021. Um, and this is all recorded by, by David and, and analyzed. 
what one notices is that there are still perfectly healthy ash trees in that wood growing right next to trees which are stone dead or look as if they're stone dead. In other words, it's not proximity to a diseased tree that gets a tree infected. It's something to do with its own resilience in the face of the disease. I mean, my firm belief is that there's a small portion of the ash in that stand which have immunity to this particular pathogen and ash which can seed in huge quantities will easily repopulate that wood if it's allowed to stand and, and, um, and um, naturally seed and if the deer are excluded enough for seedlings to grow up. Um, now this is us learning about how a natural population has reacted to the disease. How one extrapolates that to your particular wood is another matter. I think, um, well, I, I'm professionally unwilling to comment on any particular place until I've seen it. So I won't comment in particular, but in principle, I'm not saying do nothing at all because we've done this in Lady Park Wood. If you find this thing is inconveniencing, it's a mess, it's not how you like it, then for goodness sake, do something about it, I say, and clear it up. Um, but Lady Park at least tells you how things develop if you just let it. Now, one of the interesting things about this study in Lady Park Wood is that because we've known ash trees, individual ash trees, several hundred of them individually since 1945, we can analyze the impact of the disease against the, the health and vigor of those trees in the past. We can interpret the current disease in terms of the past of individual ash trees. Now, this is a complex analysis and I would have to leave it to David. In fact, I don't think it'll be too long before his dissertation is, is um, passed and his paper is in print. So we'll all have a chance to see exactly what he's found. But I think this is the unique thing about Lady Park because Eustace Jones started a record and because others of us have kept it going, we are in a position to learn more about the impacts of ash disease than we would have done otherwise. David, in fact, in visitor of wood, he was the Southeast um, uh, representative for small woods some while ago. Um, and he visited our wood some five, six years ago. Um, but secondly, we do have some uh, ash trees that replicate exactly what you described. A very healthy ash tree right next to several that are completely dead and dying and falling apart. And we have had the small woods um, sorry, the, the Future Trees Trust come in and take samples of those live trees, those vigorous trees, and graft them onto rootstock. And it's part of the ash, living ash project that they, they have in different, um, in, in, I can't remember where, but so we are participating in that. But um, so ash that are showing any kind of resistance, we are leaving, but because the disease is so um, extensive and we clear fell usually about either half a hectare or hectare at a time to replant. Um, and we choose areas which, you know, it's almost all um, very severely uh, diseased and leave the um, seemingly resistant ones um, to see what happens to them. So thank, thank you for that. I think we've got a couple of questions now uh, in. So if I can move from Ash Dieback, Martin Glynn, are you available? Yes. Martin's raising yes, yes. a question which I know is close to George's heart. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, th thank you very much, George. That's, um, it was really fascinating. Um, I, I must admit, I, although I've heard about Lady Parkwood all of my career, um, and since I was at Bangor in the 1980s as a student, I've, I've never been there, but hopefully one of these years I, I will manage to get there. Um, what I was going to ask, though, really, was about the, the future of the study itself, rather than just the future of the woodland, in terms of, of what you, you sort of think and hope might happen there, and whether or not, if, if we were to all come back in 75 years' time, whether or not we're, somebody might still be talking about the study and what we've learned at that point. And I think you've just mentioned there about what the benefits are of the long-term nature of the study. Um, you know, what, what, what do you think the chances are of another 75 years and what would it need to achieve that? Mm. Well, if we were playing that schoolboy game of battleships, you've just hit the aircraft carrier. <laughs> um, 
that the study has been kept going ostensibly by organizations, but in practice by individuals. Mm. Um, I don't think anyone at any point who has been involved here was doing it as an instruction or because it was part of their job description. So you have to understand these studies as being something which is like a, a relay race handed from one individual to another. Mm. Um, it so happens that the baton got passed to me because I was the woodland specialist for the Nature Conservancy. And, but the only time I actually spent actually in the wood was done almost at the cost of the rest of my work, the bit I was actually meant to be paid for. And that's always the case. It's a Cinderella study. Um, now, the practical thing at present is that it is, it exists as a, um, a set of records, a lot of them in my spare bedroom. Um, it exists in various forms now because of David Cracknell and his, his processing of the information. Um, it exists as a book because no one can really forget that the thing has actually happened. But as of now, there is no provision for the continuation of this study. And as I say, I'm 81 and do the arithmetic. Um, someone has got to be found to hold the baton pretty soon because we're nearly out of the takeover zone for the next handover. Thank you, George. I, I just hope that perhaps the Royal Forest Society and other such organisations to come together and find a way of achieving that because it well, would be I, a great shame to lose it. I think so too, but you have to remember that the responsible organisations have been um, severely stressed. Their funding has been cut enormously. I mean, Natural England, who are technically in charge of the recording, um, have had their funding cut by 60% since 2010, yeah. I believe. Mm. Yeah. Um, something has to give, and this is long term, yeah. not in the immediate fire brigade type operation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think also places like Forest Research, who have, to be honest, shown very little interest in this study, rather to my surprise, they've been reconstituted so that they do what they're paid to do. Yeah. And I'm not going to be able to pay them to do it. Um, yeah. so, so this thing languishes, languishes and it's because it's fallen into a kind of um, an, a, a way of doing um, um, government research, which is no longer suited to this kind of study. It badly needs to be taken on by someone, and I hope it will be, but I've done my damnedest to publicise it and make sure that someone pricks their ears up. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Martin. It's a, it's a really important question. And um, I hope that there may be even someone on this call who, who may have a, an answer to how we can ensure that the, the study continues. I think this type of longitudinal study is, um, you know, very valuable for all the reasons that we've already discussed. There's a question from Kevin Cox about bird surveys. Can I invite Kevin to um, ask his question, please? Thank you. Hello, George. Thank okay. you very much. That was, was great. The book's great. Um, you mention in the book that uh, the last bird survey, the full bird survey that was conducted was back in the 80s. And everybody knows that we've seen significant declines, of both species diversity and abundance since then of woodland birds. And I was just wondering whether there'd been a, another survey since the book was published um, and whether Lady Park Wood actually bucks the trend simply because it's untouched and certain species, I'm thinking of things like marsh tit, which doesn't like managed woodlands. I mean, there's a lot of research that suggests that marsh tit, as soon as you coppice a woodland, uh, you lose them. Wood warbler seem to be in um, precipitous decline at the moment. And you mentioned that this was a wood where wood warbler were found. Uh, we, I live on Dartmoor, we've pretty much lost all of our wood warblers in the last six or seven years. And I just wondered whether or not um, there were, uh, whether there has been a survey or whether there were plans to do that. Well, thank you for asking. Again, is, um, well, in the game of battleships, you certainly hit a cruiser there. Um, the study started as a study of trees. The only additional thing which has been on a sim similar scale has been the study of the ground vegetation. Um, 
the flora, which um, let's face it, is something even poor naturalists like myself can identify. There was a lot of interest in the fauna immediately after the wood became an SSSI. It's only in the 1980s, long after the project had started. Um, but the bird survey and an invertebrate survey and that sort of thing were done. And nothing of great interest was found as I understand it. And um, people basically haven't been back. If there are, are, I mean, I find it very difficult to believe there are no knowledgeable bird people who had a look at Lady Park Wood, but I am not one of them and I don't know what they've found. The one which we really want to know something about would be the invertebrates, because there's around dickens of a lot of dead wood in there now. It'd be very nice to see if there's anything worthwhile in there. Um, but in, nine, in, in the mid 1980s, there wasn't very much of great interest. The group which has really proven to be um, diverse is the fungi. The, fung the Dean fungal group were enticed by me into the wood on one occasion and then they found far more than they were expecting and came back and came back and ran up a list of about 450 species with not a huge number of visits. Apparently it was on course to be an elite site, but um, I don't think they've been in recent years, unfortunately. So. It is possible <coughs> that the wood has responded in wildlife terms. The flora is very much poorer. The butterflies have basically vanished. Um, I really don't know much about the birds. Apart from anything else, I'm getting deaf enough that the only thing I can hear is crows. And um, there aren't many of those about. So um, I'm sorry, I, that's a very disappointing answer, but it is a, a problem that Unlike Whiteham Wood, which has been studied with the full resources of Oxford University and across the whole range of the ecosystem, Lady Park Wood has studied, is started as an Oxford adjunct to study the trees and has never had a research station or a group of people committed to doing research projects within it. And so there's a lot to be done there. I would, like you, like to know more about whether the birds are taking advantage of the habitat there. My guess is that they like a bit of open space as well. The flora is devastated and if you want to see plants and nectar sources and things like that you have to go outside the reserve. So there's an awful lot of things have to come together there but we badly need a bit more biological survey. We'll see what we can do. I, I might talk to colleagues at the RSPB about that. Um, right. I, I, you know, and I think things that were found in the 1980s uh, which weren't of interest then are of significant interest now. The fact that you talk about all three species of woodpecker, we know that since the 1980s, lesser spotted woodpecker has declined by over 90%. And I wouldn't be surprised, given the invertebrates, the dead wood, that's, that it hangs on in Lady Park Wood. Let's hope so. Yeah. I see, Dave, I see David Cracknell has arrived. I was just going to say, um... A, it would be a wonderful result, Kevin, if, if you did liaise with George and could get anyone to, to do research on, on birds. But um, just before we move to the second half of the evening, George, you and you could introduce David and we could just move back to, to what's been found on the on Ash dieback so far. Right. Um, hello, David. Are you there? Yes. Hello, George. Sorry about that. I, I had a difficult train journey back from Sheffield yeah. today. Don't worry, you have an important life. I'm just a retired gentleman. Um, You're I, a legend, George. You're a legend. You know that. I, I have, I have, I have pointed out that you've been doing some research, and it'll be published shortly, and it'll be earth shaking and that sort of thing. Oh. Um, I, I don't know whether you want to spend a minute just giving a, a gist of what you found. That's almost the most difficult question of all. Yes. But if you if you've got a minute a, a minute spiel, that would be helpful. Yes, well, thank you for, for picking me up there, George. Uh, I'll do my best uh, in, in just a minute without repetition and, uh, and uh, hesitation. Um, essentially, um, George um, kindly invited me into Lady Parkwood in 2019 to help him uh, measure the extent of ash dieback. Now, the great advantage of Lady Parkwood, as, as you've probably heard, is that it's got these uh, longitudinal, longitudinal records um, going back uh, uh, decades. And um, what we were able to do is uh, we, we both recorded the extent of dieback by looking at the crowns and, uh, uh, and giving them a percentage score 
for what was left. Um, and we also counted the epicormic growth, which is a sign of stress, the trunk, the crown and the base uh, sprouts that were appearing. And we, we put all this information into the data sheets and we did it again in 2020, although not quite as many. And um, I then spent uh, a year or so mastering uh, statistics and uh, R coding from scratch and, and put all the numbers in. And uh, I also mastered um, a certain bit of spatial analysis, which is a, a sort of fairly modern way of looking at uh, the way trees are related. Um, you know, and we have, of course, the 1977 onwards records of which are accurate about the distance between the trees, enough anyway to establish what, for example, the, the four or five, six trees in the neighbourhood are. And the findings are that we're, first time we've been able to show that there is a strong correlation between um, ash dieback and the severity of the disease and the uh, growth rate, uh, prior growth rate, both relative and absolute. Uh, and there was a negative correlation there statistically, um, which, um, you know, suggests that tree vigour is obviously very important to the extent of the disease and, and protection against it. Um, the other findings were um, there's something, a concept called species mingling, which essentially is a score you can give a tree individually for how much it is mixing with other species. And um, there's also another uh, spatial factor we, can, we, 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 we looked at, which was how, how much a tree by its size is dominant amongst its near neighborhood of four or five, six neighbors. And we, we found strong correlations between the extent of mingling with other species actually in some cases led to more disease, which is counterintuitive because we actually thought that it would lead to less because in ecology, there is this concept of um, dilution of a disease and herd immunity and so on. But uh, we actually found in some cases it was the opposite and that um, perhaps some types of trees, and this is for a later research, some species might actually be making it worse and some might be making it um, uh, better for the ash tree. Uh, and this is cor corroborated by other research, actually. Um, and um, in terms of size dominance of the ash tree, when a tree was an ash tree was dominant within its neighborhood by its size, um, it, it was actually found to be uh, less likely to be severely infected. And this also correlates with other findings that the larger a tree, um, the less severe the infection. That said, some people have suggested that might be because it takes longer for that tree to be infected. But other things we found, such as the position in the canopy was important, of course, the higher up, again, confirming other results, um, there was less infection. That's that's the headlines. Um, but obviously, I can take any questions. Thank you, David, for hot footing it to us. Um, I think if we can return to that in a minute, because um, I did want to move. We're, we're now into the second half of the evening. So I think just move to um, Art Meets Ecology for a moment. Um, and we can perhaps come back to that question of ash um, and those findings. So please put your questions in the chat. In the meantime, um, George, the Lady Parkwood has inspired, or that area has inspired artists for a long, long time. Um, could you just tell us how you became involved? And um, I know that we have a couple of pictures and you have a reading to give us. Yeah, so yeah. perhaps you could just move us to that. Well, a lifetime as an ecologist and conservationist has told me that most of the people I speak to when I lecture or write are actually ecologists and conservationists. And what one really needs is to get to other people, um, to the general public, especially as the um, environmental crisis deepens. And um, it's well known that um, involvement between science and art has many synergistic effects. Forestry Commission itself, in my experience, pioneered this sort of thing years ago. And was it Grisdale with a sculpture trails and things like that? Anyway, um, not being original at all, um, my wife is a landscape artist, an amateur landscaping artist. As a result, I spend my time occasionally trogging around art galleries and the like. And, and one consequence of this was that I came across this group of artists who 
um, were interested in painting woodlands and trees, the arboreals. To cut a long story short, I thought, well, what chance I get them to Lady Park Wood to have one of their projects there and try and bring out, as it were, the essence of, um, of natural woodland in artistic form and therefore by this means get to a broader audience than I get to as an ecologist and conservationist and as a forester. And this is what we did and they spent quite a lot of time in mainly 2017 in the wood, came up with lots of um, paintings and drawings which were the subject of a, a long exhibition in Monmouth which came to a shuddering halt with Covid of course and having done this, we thought there might be some benefit in trying to put what we'd done together in the form of a book. So, well, this is what we produced. This book, which you had a chance to see, um, is illustrated almost entirely by the paintings they produced. But um, the writing is my writing about what ecological and conservation thoughts each of these pictures generated in me. Now, whether this works as a combination is a matter of taste, of course, and um, I'd be very interested in anyone wants to say whether it does or doesn't, or at least uh, give me reasons as well. Um, but this is what we were trying to do. Um, we sold out of the complete print run of this thing um, last year, and we've printed some more, so it's now back on well, Amazon, I think, is the cheapest way of getting hold of it. I, I hasten to add, you probably realise that anyway. So the book is available still. And um, I would like to think that um, it's made a, a lot more people think about aspects of ecology and woodlands um, who wouldn't otherwise have come up against it in quite this form. Thank you. Um, I know that we have teed you up for another short reading. Yeah. Um, and with the magic of Chris and screen sharing, I'm hoping that we can well, I, I, pictures to go with that. I wanted to show, there's a picture, just before I do a reading, I just thought this was, this was real. The artist really did work in the woods. That's Fiona McIntyre um, drawing a part of Lady Park Wood towards the top of the wood. And you can see both the almost completed work and the scene that she is drawing. Um, one of the interesting things which was significant to her was that she left some of her materials behind and found that to give it some sort of brownish tint, she actually had to use the soil of the wood that she was drawing. And that, so the painting itself incorporates a, a sliver of, of the actual wood in the form of um, earth marks and things which um, give it a, an added depth of significance. But the next slide is the, is the picture I wanted to do a short reading about, if we can get the next slide on. Um, now, this is what Abby Kramer produced. I looked at it and I thought, what the Dickens is that? And it's very much her style. Um, I mean, it's very attractive, simply the, there's a pattern and colours, but I thought, what on earth is she painting in the wood? Why is that related to the wood? Well, she disabused me and showed me the color slide um, from which she had drawn this, as it were. It's, it's simply an oak um, mini pollard with a, which died many, many years ago, leaving a branch stump on the top. Anyway, this is what I wrote about. I called it the lambent flame image, um, though Abby simply labeled it Lady Park Two. Um, and I said, it reminded me of driftwood fires in the grate at the hut at Scaldhead Island, a nature reserve on the North Norfolk coast. At first glance, it has nothing to do with Lady Park or any other broadleaf woodland, none of which will actually burn. However, the inspiration was, as I've described, a long dead bark free but still standing stump of an oak mini pollard that died with one trunk still attached. In real life, it will take the best part of a century to decay, oxidizing the wood and returning its mineral nutrients to the soil. By portraying the dead tree as a flame and the leaf litter as a carpet of embers, 
she shows this essential process of returning mineral nutrients to the soil in accelerated time. Now, I still don't know whether that's how she thought of it, but that's how I reacted to it. And the book is full of this kind of reaction to an artist's um, image um, from my standpoint as an ecologist who knows the wood. That's it. Thank you. I don't know if we have any arboreals in the audience. If, if we do, and you'd like to make yourself known, perhaps you could tell us how you found working in the wood. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just going to go back, if I may, to David Cracknell. David, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, so we've we've heard it here first, really. Some of your some of your findings there. Mm -hmm. um, I I would personally just like to explore with you for a moment um, your your findings about the fact that those in mixed groups seem to be more susceptible, if I understood you correctly. Yeah. Uh, that than others. Any any sort of thoughts on why that that might be? Uh, there is. Um, I mean, what what. <laughs> What uh, what the research has done is effectively, I mean, my 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 fellow tutor, my tutor at Bangor, John Healy, uh, actually said I've I've pretty much done two thirds of a PhD, and there's about six papers in all this. Um, there's there's so much material, but um, it there is some suggestion that uh, leaf litter chemistry might be uh, an issue uh, um, uh, that some uh, there's, a, there's generally believed to be a correlation between um, alkaline soils and more severe dieback. And um, there's some suggestion that more acid soils or acid leaf litter could somehow kill off the, um, the fun, fungus in, in the leaf litter. Because as you know, in, this, in, the, um, in, the, in the winter season, it, uh, it, it, it's in the leaf litter and it kind of... Uh, um, uh, propagates there uh, only to be blown up again in the summer to reinfect further trees so there's some suggestion it might might be suppressed uh, by the soil chemistry or the or the litter uh, chemistry so um, other people um, uh, have found that certain species uh, are good and certain species aren't so good and the presence of beech was actually found to be um, uh, not good for ash um, in other woodlands in Eastern Europe. And I think it's fair to say that in the old growth um, above the cliff, there's a lot of beach, but I wasn't able to explore the, the, the combinations of species that were worse. That is something that will be really interesting to look at, but there's a slightly difficult scientific um, problem there, which you have to sort of find a way of scoring uh, the other species. Um, or their combinations in a way which could then be put number crunched um, to make it to see if it was significant. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about my disappearing act. Um, I was told my voice had gone a bit staticky, so hopefully it's a bit better now. Loud and clear. Yeah. Great. Um, I've got another um, submitted question so I'm going to to go to that but we're running out of time so if you do have a, a question for George please please do put it into the chat so George my question for you here is within your book you talk about um, the importance of vegetative growth um, and the uh, versus sort of regeneration um, and the question has come in, had foresters underestimated the impact of brambles, deer, lack of light can have on regeneration? What species are currently regenerating well? The short answer is none are regenerating well. None are regenerating at all, save for a few beech, which happen to have been protected by being the survivors amongst some of those blowdowns where they are protected by fallen stems of larger trees. Um, in the last three years, um, deer have basically eaten the lot. Um, 
the artists, the arboralists, will be shocked if they go to the wood now. It's not only lost all its ground, um, all its regenerating patches, it's um, got a lot of dead ash trees in it as well. The, the wood has taken a nosedive in all conventional evaluations. Um, as for bramble, that is a bit of a, um, I don't know, a mixed blessing is how I would call it. Um, one of the things which I never witnessed, but Eustace Jones recorded, was what happened after 1945 when um, half the wood was actually shelter wood felled for the war effort. Um, that regenerated and is now 80 whatever years old um, with a scatter of older trees within it. it looks rather like ex coppice with standards, of course. And in the decade immediately after the wartime felling, the bramble was said to be three or four feet high. And yet there is a complete stock of trees in that wood. Um, it didn't prevent that wood closing canopy within 10 to 15 years. Um, how did it do it? Well, I think one of the th important things is that a lot of the regeneration actually came off the stumps of the trees which were felled for the wartime felling. It was a coppice regeneration. We've tracked all the trees and we know their origin um, and we know that the survival rate of coppice stems and their growth rates are far better than those of seedling origin for the species which have, have regenerated by both means. Um, so vegetative reproduction there has proved important and in fact superior in some respects. In more recent times, when the fence was put up in 2007, there was a colossal amount of regeneration from lime. Almost all of it was from the bases of the trunks of existing large trees and a few of the places where a, a branch had dipped to the soil, rooted at the tip and had formed a layer, a new individual at some distance from the stool. Um, very little of it was seedling regeneration. Um, but it was thickening up the wood nicely. But the fence failed just too soon, um, a bit later, and it would have got away. But most of it um, has been severely smashed by deer who, as you know, sort of tend to break them in half. A few stems, the larger stems, have survived. So it's the, it's the vegetative regeneration of 2010, 27 to 2017 that has actually survived the most recent in ingress of deer. Um, and there are many other instances where most of the regeneration has come vegetatively. Hazel, for example, of course, is, makes sense too. So in learning about um, how natural woodlands work, one of the things one has to remember is that a lot of this regeneration in practice is vegetative. It comes from the stumps, it comes from fallen trees which regenerate as colonnades of new trees along the length of the trunk and so on. It's really quite impressive that a natural woodland doesn't perform as like um, a population of lollipop shaped trees at all. It takes all forms. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Um, we're coming to the end of the time. So I'm just going to make two announcements or two, two further things. So one is that our next book club, we take a bit of a rest now, will be in November when we have Jonathan Drory and Tracy Chevalier together, Jonathan talking about Around the World in 80 Trees and Tracy talking about her book At the Edge of the Orchard. So I think we'll be talking a lot about tree movement, pioneers, settlers, and I hope you will all join us for that. That is now available to book. And then just finally, I'm going to give the last word to George, who, who thank you so much, George. It's been a wonderful evening. And I think we all, you know, from what you say and from what David says um, and from what Nick said, there's a still the opportunity for research in that woodland is, is immense still. And I do hope that that gets taken up. But okay. what I want, wanted to have a last word with you about and give you the last word on is because I know that in your retirement, your project has been meadows and not yeah. trees. Would you like to just say a very quick word about what well, you're I, doing I, with meadows? I, I got rather rather um, jaded about woodlands for a while. So I took up meadows and the Y Valley and produced books on them. It's only now that I've gone back to being a woodland ecologist. Um, but as a final word, can I leave you with um, 
I don't know, a kind of puzzle. Um, this is an ecological study. One of the curiosities is that since the book was, was published, it is the National Small Woods Association and yourselves who have shown most interest in the project and the results, not the ecologists who have, I wouldn't say studiously ignored it, but I've had very little reaction from the ecological world at all. And I'm very curious as to know why that should be. Um, it surprised me certainly. Um, I wish it were otherwise. Um, as far as the artists are concerned, one of the things which most impressed me was that um, the, the artists who came to the wood expressed very strong feelings about the value of this wood for them personally. They wouldn't express them in the same terms that I express them as a, someone with a scientific background. Um, obviously more a matter of feelings, emotions and such like. Um, and they are the ones who, um, as it were, ought to be the supporters of those of us in conservation, but we don't really get to them by being scientific throughout. We need to broaden our appeal. And I think that's important. As a final thing, can I, I just wanted to show you one image if I, no. No, sorry about this. Um, I can go on as a scientist about how the woods develop, mortality of trees, rates of fall of big trees and such like. And I can, but I can express the fact that most of the time this wood is very quiet and gentle and silent, but occasionally it releases most intense pent up damaging energies. And I think that I can say that as a scientist, I can even give it numbers if necessary, but one image by Annabel Cullen, which won't show very clearly on the screen, um, of a branch which is smashed by another tree falling, brings out the inherent violence of natural woodland, as well as anything I could possibly say or quantify. And I think it is important that, that people in the practical world um, link up more with the people in the artistic and world and the world of feelings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'll hand over to Chris to say a final goodbye and uh, just a thank you from me. Yeah, thank you, George. And uh, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed uh, the evening and and, uh, and learn something perhaps along the way, and lots of uh, interesting questions were asked, and lots of things to ponder about uh, how we go from here. It's a fascinating study, and uh, as George has said, it's perhaps not the way that you might want to manage uh, too many woodlands, but it's certainly interesting to see what happens when um, when sort of management is let go in the way it has uh, really got word and certainly. studied in the way it has. So thank you everyone, and um, see you again next time. Good night.